And it's so very good to be back with everybody tonight. And we trust that all of us will be getting along well and the lungs will be feeling a lot better as time goes on. Uh, first of all, while it's fresh on my mind, I congratulate Stephen for that fine message. It certainly hits things right where they are. And it's not only one that in principle deals with the specific matter he dealt with, but in so many other things that are immoral. And the only way we can do that is to have an absolute objective standard, which is God's word. And if we ever lose sight of the fact that man can know absolute truth and that the Bible is an infallible objective standard, the final revelation of God to man, then we are truly cast adrift. It would, it's interesting to note that the Apostle John, as well as all the writers of the Bible, and especially the New Testament, being that they were directed by the Holy Spirit, and we may say by that, that of course God wrote the Bible, that he is pointing out to brethren 2,000 years ago there's a right way and there's a wrong way. You can't do that without an absolute objective standard. If it's a subjective standard, everybody would just pretty well choose whatever they want, and that'll be right to them. So as we approach the study of the Bible, it's not just an expression of a lot of people who are 2,000 years old opinion. This is the Word of God. It is where God expresses his will for man, and it's the only place that you can find what's right and wrong from God's perspective. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. And coming back to John, 1 John chapter 4, we're looking about verse 7, where we left off somewhere around here last time together. Addressing the brethren, he says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. Now let's always keep in mind that this letter was written so as he could help the people addressed in it to deal with a certain false doctrine. And he's trying to point out and does so very well that the love of which he speaks is a love that seeks another person's highest good. It's not the highest good that person may think for himself or herself, but it's God's definition of one's highest good and thus to love God and to love oneself as one ought to and to love one's neighbor as himself and to love his brethren is to always seek yourself and everybody else's highest good so we learn how to love God and one another and everybody else by learning the truth of God and how to live in harmony with it. In verse 8, he says, He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. I know there are multiplied thousands of people who could say, though they might not know where to find it, such as 1 John 4, 8, that God is love. And they'd be able to point out that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3, verse 16. Well, love is manifest in both places. And of course, it is John the Apostle who wrote both of those as the Holy Spirit inspired him to write. That is, infallibly guided him to write. Now think for a moment. God is love. But I also read in God's word his revelation to man for the good of man, his ultimate good, getting him to heaven. It also warns us that the God of love is a God of justice. One does not mitigate against the other. And when we consider that the Bible is full of material that talks about the judgment of God, sometimes judging the world, but then the final judgment, when all things end of this physical universe, 
that all men will be brought before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account of the deeds done in the body, whether good or bad. Well, this is the Christ who loved us and gave himself for us. This is the Christ whom the Father, loving us so much, gave him so that he could live a perfect life, emptied in every point like we are yet without sin, and therefore go to the cross, suffer, bleed, and die, and thus make it possible that we could be forgiven of every sin and stand before God justified. Yet we find when we look at what the scripture says about the judgment that God makes it clear in the scriptures that part of those people at the judgment, he'll talk about goats being those who are lost, that they will be told to depart into everlasting punishment. Some people say, how can he be a God of love and do that? It's because we, in this lifetime, have a choice. Yes, he made us free moral agents. He gave us intellect and the power of reason. God reasons with us. He doesn't force us because, you see, that would not be what a loving father does. He doesn't force us against our will. He lets us choose. He urges us to choose the right way. He does that in so many different compelling ways. Yet we can still reject him. And we can even possibly live a pretty good life on earth while completely denying his existence or denying the deity of Christ or denying that the Bible is the word of God. But there's a day of reckoning coming. We are in a, we're in a state of probation now. Will we love God and keep his commandments? Will we have faith in him and his system of salvation? Such a faith that leads us to accept it by obedience to his will, Hebrews 5 and verse 9, or will we not? Will we obey it, live for a while, keeping his commandments as Christians, and then the world becomes a alluring factor again, and we have more love for it than we do continuing to live the Christian life, and therefore we fall away from the truth. The point is, when we come to the judgment, we come to the judgment having proved to God in this life that we love him, that we want to be with him, and to be with him, we've done our best on earth to be like his son in following what's authorized in the New Testament. Or we have proven to him that we didn't want to be with him, that we didn't respect his son, certainly not loving him, and no faith in him or his gospel system. And God says, you can go your way then. And the way you go and the place you go to eternally is completely without God in any form or fashion degree. And thus, it's a place of weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth, eternal torment, no end whatsoever, no relief ever, no hope ever, no God. Why? Because that's what the people chose by their disobedience to God's plan to forgive them of their sins. And thus, God says, go your way. Depart from me. I never knew you. And the everlasting fire is prepared for the devil and his angels. So this love that John speaks of here, and anywhere the Bible speaks of it, as John is, is a love that compels us to show forth the same disposition of mind toward everybody as Jesus did. Notice it never causes one to compromise the truth. Man must know God's truth in order to be saved by God. Not just an intellectual venture, but understanding the way of salvation and how we accept the salvation we don't deserve and that God has graciously given us by belief and obedience to the truth, Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 9. So in this was manifested the love of God toward us, verse 9, because that God sent his only begotten son into the world. Now watch it, that we might live through him. Notice we live 
through him. Jesus said in John 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. John echoes that here. And he says here in verse 10 is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Remember, propitiation is appeasement. Men usually think about trying to appease God, but it's God who sent his son to become a man. And in what Christ did that we could never do, he appeased his own heavenly father. I simply direct you back to the prophecy of Isaiah and Isaiah chapter 53, written some 750 years before Jesus walked this earth, to see how it would be that the suffering servant, Jesus Christ, would appease the wrath of God. He was innocent. He had no sin. He could therefore die on behalf of others. So he is the propitiation for our sins. Now, beloved, he says, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. So again, he's back to our as Christians. Remember, remember, Christian means of Christ, that we show forth that same love one toward another. But then in the charge that Jesus has given to the church to preach the gospel, God's power to save men from sin, Romans 1, 16, to a lost and dying world, as we want to say, then we must show forth the same love that the Father and that Christ showed as we labor to render our bodies living sacrifices in spreading the gospel, in defending the gospel, in living the gospel in our lives. Then in verse 12, no man hath seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. Now, I know that we all recognize that when we're born of the water and the spirit, John 3, three and five, into the kingdom of God, verse five, that we are new creatures in Christ. Thus, there's room for growth and development. As Peter says, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. The inspired writer of the Hebrews commented that the people he addressed, at least some of them, had not used their time as members of the Lord's church, as God's children, as they all, And thus, they had not had their senses exercised to discern both good and evil, and they needed to go back through the first principles again. They were still babes in Christ when they had had enough time to be mature and to know what was more complex in living the Christian life. So we're expected to use our time from the time we're baptized into Christ for however long we have to live after that in possession of our faculties to grow in the love of God and the love of our brethren and of men who need the gospel of Christ. So we see then that if we want the love of which we speak and John writes here, the one that always wills another the highest good, that good being being in fellowship with God and staying that way, so heaven will be our home, and we'll grow in that. We'll understand more about it. We'll see things as Christ saw them as he lived on this earth, and we'll have we'll build at least the same relationship to this world that Christ had. Thus, nothing of this present world or anything in it will be so great as to cause us to give up walking according to the commandments of God. So love is perfected as we do God's will. As we do God's will, we love God and we love our brethren. So we go on down through the chapter and we see verse 13. Hereby know we that we dwell in him. I don't know all that is to know about dwelling in God and God dwelling in us. But I do know I can understand this. That if I know that God has authorized me to act in a certain way, 
or he has forbidden me from doing something. That is, I know when he commanded me that if I do from the heart what he said, or I leave it alone when he said, don't do it, then I know that I have a relationship with the Father and he with me, as nobody else does but those who are doing the same thing. So hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit. Now let's keep in mind, John has the Holy Spirit guiding him infallibly even as he writes this letter. This is still in the days of the miraculous works of the Spirit in the Lord's church. We studied that earlier, where John says they have an anointing or unction from the Spirit, and they know all things, the all things being qualified in the sense that they knew what was necessary to deal with the false teachers that he was talking about. But what we need to know here is that he's talking about the same thing. Now, some people might not accept that, but it's John saying we have that. Now, if you look at the usage of that word we throughout this, in most cases, it's John using it along with the other apostles, or meaning he and the other apostles. He remembers started this book, this letter, by saying that I want you to have the same fellowship with the Father that we, the apostles of Christ, have within. And he continues down that road. So, hereby we know that we dwell in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. Now, the spirit primarily works to reveal the truth and to confirm the truth to be from heaven, from God, and not from men by the miracle signs and wonders. The miraculous gifts, and we won't spend more time on that other than to refer to it. All of them listed in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, there are nine of them. They were in the early church because there was no completed New Testament. But they were expected to be faithful to God, even as we are, and to serve him faithfully. So they had those in lieu of the completed New Testament. So when he talks about having the Spirit, he means we have what's necessary to be faithful to God. Well, faith comes by hearing the word of God, Romans 10, 17. If they have what's necessary to be faithful to God, and it's of the Spirit, then they have the will of God that they can draw from to be able to continue down the path we call the straight and narrow way, the way to heaven. Now, notice as he goes further. Verse 14. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Now, here's another reason that I know the we here is not just taking in all Christians. Notice what he said. We have seen and do testify. The apostles you give, as we say today, I witness testimony. That was part of their work as apostles of Jesus Christ. So he has to be including the apostles in the we and primarily referring to them. We have seen and do testify. What did they see? And what did they testify to? That the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. We can't do it now, but go back to the first part of this letter and see how he begins. He says, we have handled, we've touched, we know from empirical evidence, eyewitness relationship, that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God and that he came in the flesh. So he says plainly that he's the Savior of the world. We've seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Now watch verse 15. Whosoever, now that is brought as the race, Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwells in him and he in God. I said earlier, I don't understand all about what is meant by that, but I do know that God put it on a level where I can grasp the truth of God, and in that truth, 
what God obligates me to do to show my love of God and my faith in God and his system, the gospel system, to save me. So that's what he's getting at here. Though he speaks to those who've already heard, believed, and obeyed the gospel, and he's writing to them, remember that their joy may be full and that they would always have the fellowship that the apostles have with God, with the Father. So whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him and he in God. That again hits directly at the Gnostic heresy. Then he says, and we have known and believed the love that God has to us. Again, he says, God is love. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God and God in him. Question, how do you dwell in the love of which John speaks and not keep his commandments? Well, you can't do it. And nowhere throughout this letter do you have one set against the other. In other words, if you love God, you have to keep his commandments. If you keep his commandments, you don't love God. Well, I remember when we love God, the proof of it is the keeping of his commandments. And you'll look over here in verse John 5. We'll get to it again here in a minute. And he says in verse 2 and verse 3, by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. So he then says in verse 17, herein is our love made perfect. Well, I think all of us would say as Christians, we want our love to be complete. We want it to be perfect. He says, the reason for that is that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Well, what is a complete love? It's one that always leads you to do what God tells you to do. And the way God tells you to do it, and for the reason, sometimes more reason, more than one reason why he tells you to do it. A love is not complete or perfect if it does not lead you to obey God. And that is made clear in so many different, different places. He's the author of eternal salvation unto all of them that obey him. So herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, so are we in this world. Remember, when the faithful child of God stands before Christ in judgment, he will stand there covered by the blood of Christ, sins remitted, no sins held against him. That's already been established in 1 John 1, 7. If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Well, let me show you something, and I think I've already mentioned it, but again, I want you to take note of it. When Luke, by inspiration, recorded the beginning of the church in Jerusalem on that first Pentecost following the resurrection of Christ, he said in Acts 2, and verse 42, telling about what the church was doing, that they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Now focus on that for a minute. In 1 John 1, 7, he said, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. Can you conceive of somebody keeping the doctrine of the apostles and not walking in the light as Christ is in the light? Or can you conceive of someone walking in the light as Christ is in the light and not remaining steadfast in the apostles' doctrine? The way that the will of Christ was put on this earth was by the Holy Spirit through the apostles. The early church knew that. So they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. To continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine is to walk in the light as he is in the light. To do that, one is walking by faith and not by sight, 2 Corinthians 5, 7. But faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So to walk by faith and not by sight, to continue steadfastly the apostles' doctrine, to walk in the light as he is in the light, is simply to walk according to the direction of the rightly divided word of God, 2 Timothy 2, verse 16. 
coherent is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. So are we in this present age. What do you mean, so are we in this present age? As he is, so are we in this present world, this present age. We're living as the Father, through his word, directs us to live. Now, Christ made it clear that he always did those things that pleased his Father, and that his very food was to feed upon the will of the Father and to do. Well, now, how has that changed for us as members of the spiritual body of Christ, with Christ as the only head? When we're taught plainly, whatsoever you do, in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father by him, Colossians 3.17. And notice again, when he says we can stand boldly before the throne of judgment, Christ's judgment seat. He then says in verse 18, there is no fear in love. Why is that the case? Well, he's already talked about our love being made perfect. What makes it perfect? The love that we have for God and the love we have for the things of God, the gospel of Christ being one of those things, is the love that always leads us to obey him. That's exactly why there's no fear in love. But perfect love casteth out fear. Well, remember, that's love that's complete. What is a complete love? One that just with the mouth professes love of God? Or is it the love that leads us to always do what he said? Notice, because fear hath torment. Well, let's camp on that just for a moment. Why are there so many tormenting people in this world? Because they're full of fear. Why are they so full of fear? Well, God has set eternity in the heart of every human being. There is in the back of one's mind, for lack of a better way to put it, always the idea that I must come before God. And people know, though they may be very confused about it, it's built in that there's a right and a wrong. Things ought to be a certain way. They ought not be a certain way. And thus, people who are not reconciled to God, having their sins forgiven through their belief and obedience to the gospel, people out here in the world may seem to be so very happy, but they're not. They're haunted. There's something eating at them all the time. They're always trying to push something in the back of their mind they don't want to remember. But now the Christian doesn't have to worry about that. The Christian has already admitted that when God said all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, that person said, that's right. Nobody's to blame for my sin but me. And now I cast myself upon the favor and mercy of God through belief and obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thus I take him at his word, and I believe in him, repent of my sins as commanded in Acts 1730, confess my faith in him publicly, Romans 10, 10, and I'm baptized in Christ by the authority of Christ for the remission of my past sin. Acts 2, verse 38. Now I know the Lord, true to his word, has added me to the spiritual body of Christ. I now have joy because my sins are remitted. I stand complete in him. My love is complete. And I'm going to grow up more and more in understanding how Christ lived in this world, of how I should live. So there's no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. So we'll see this just a, a moment in, in chapter five again, but notice he emphasizes here in the next verse, verse 19, we love him because he first loved us. There's so many people who don't understand God, who are caught up in the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life, and they're miserable. When if they would learn of him, listen to him, receive his meekness of speech, and find his engrafted word, they would recognize that God loves them. God cares for them. You may not realize this, maybe a good time to say it. You hear many times that 
Jews, Christians, and Muslims all worship the same God. I suggest to you that they may think they do, but their concept, underscore the word concept, their concept of God is so different. Take Islam for a moment. When you look at Allah, you realize he does not love unconditionally. The Quran makes it clear that he hates all those people that are sinners. That he's not merciful to those who are sinners. Well, that's not the case with our Heavenly Father. And John's making that clear right here, as does the whole of the Scripture. God is merciful. And as Peter will say in 2 Peter 3, 9, he's not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. If you're a Muslim, you have to constantly try to earn God's mercy. And you're busy doing all kinds of things they would consider to be good works because you don't know for sure whether you're acceptable to him or not. And that's a sad situation. I, I would suggest that if you ever have a chance to visit with a Muslim, that you deal with that and more particularly in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus came because of his love for all mankind, John 3, verse 16. And he loved us while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. And that's an amazing thing. And that's something Christianity had, nobody else had. And again, the various concepts of the Jews of God, I don't know all of them. Some might have the right concept. The problem is they don't accept Jesus Christ of Nazareth as their Messiah, the anointed one, the Son of God. And Jesus said to them when he was on this earth, except ye believe that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. So again, the Jew or the Muslim, whichever way you want to go, do not really have a proper concept of God in more ways than I just described, but at least in those ways. Then in verse 20, if a man say, you know, we can say about anything. We can boast about a lot of things. People do all the time. But if a man say, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. John's very bold in his writing. He's very plain spoken, frank, candid, and to the point. So you can't hate your brethren and say you love God. It won't work that way. This also tells us that scriptural church corrective discipline, when carried out with the right attitude and for the right reason, can't be said, or those that do it, can't be said to be hating their bread. Why, they're not. If you read 1 Corinthians chapter 5, you'll see the brother that had his father's wife, and Paul urged them to withdraw fellowship from him. You'll see, that wasn't to destroy the man. It was to cause him to come to repentance. And if he wouldn't, it would keep him from polluting the rest of the church by his bad example. But all of it is because God loves him. The man say, I love God, made of his brother, he's a liar. For he that loveth not God, or he that loveth not his brother, who he has seen. How can he love God whom he's not seen? So it seems to me the people that hate their bread are those that carry grudges against them, won't carry out the way the Lord settled those things. It seems to me that the churches that claim to love every members, that they won't practice corrective church discipline to the point if they need to or withdraw fellowship from they don't love them. They have some other thing that may be some goofy emotional attachment, but they're not seeking that person's highest good. The love of God and the love that God has for us always seeks that person's highest good. Notice verse 21. And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God loveth brother. Well, you know, if I love God, I keep his commandments. And I'll keep his commandments concerning my brethren as I love them. And yet it's Paul who says to Timothy, preach the word, 
be instant in season and out of season. Now watch. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Well, you'll notice reprove, rebuke, and exhort is really getting on people's cases. And the brethren sometimes need their cases got known. And if we love them, then we'll say what needs to be said and do what needs to be done. And what needs to be said and needs to be done is what the Bible teaches. We don't have any other way to go. How do we know how to deal with anybody except that God directs us? Well, that's where we're seeking to do his will. And we should have the attitude of my, my will that thine be done. Now we come into what we have in our Bibles in the fifth chapter of 1 John. And he begins by saying, whosoever is brought and proposed address are needed that need what he's going to write. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. In other words, if you love the Father, then you love the Son. Again, keep in mind that he's addressing them primarily at this time regarding that false doctrine of Gnosticism that is among them. Now we get back to what we've already quoted and have, have had reason to go to it even before tonight in this class. In verse 2, by this we know that we love the children of God. Now that really ties into what I said in the last couple of verses in the last chapter. How do I know? How can I honestly evaluate myself and know whether I love God or I don't love God? Well, the Holy Spirit had John write, by this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and keep his commandments. I don't think language could be clearer than that. If you're honest with yourself, then you can know whether you're doing God's will or you're not. And that's what he's saying. So again, for this is the love of God. What is the love of God? Verse 30. He says, this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. They're not grievous, because whatever God commands us to do, we know it's for our good and designed to lead us from earth to heaven. How was Christ able to endure the cross? Because he knew it was for our good. He knew that if he did not undergo that terrible ordeal, man would not be saved. Now, somebody said the nails held him to the cross. No, it's the love of your soul and my soul that held him to the cross. And the doing of the Father's will to save us. And there was no other way. Think about it this way. If you were the only human in the world and you sinned, Christ would have had to have died for you. That makes it rather personal. It ought to be personal. People ought to realize that it's made, we're made that way to where out of all of the millions and millions and millions of people that when you approach God, you approach him personally. And you approach the truth personally. The truth of the gospel. God's power to save. And when each person obeys from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered them and therefore they're made free from sin because God forgives them. Romans 6, 17 and 18 and earlier in the chapter, verses 3 and 4. Then we need to understand that we're enjoying the very love of God that sent his son and the love of the son to save us and the example that's set as to how we're to live and the attitude we're to take for the Father's will as we live in the church. So for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his com commandments are not grievous. And I'll leave you with this point, if, from this, at least at this verse. If you think there's a commandment that's grievous, knowing all the commandments of God lead us from earth to heaven, not a one of them sends you the other direction. Tell me which one of the commandments of God is grievous. Doesn't mean we don't have to exercise our minds and our wills to submit to God's will. But we do it because we know it is good for us. 
God wouldn't tell us to do something if it wasn't good for us spiritually. In verse 4, for whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. Now think about that for a minute. He just said his command his commandments are not grievous. Why? Because every commandment that God gives to man for him to obey, and he's the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him, Hebrews 5 9, is for our good. How do you overcome the world? Look at verse 4. For whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. How do you do that? By keeping his commandments. Now, if you say, well, there's another way, what is it? What is it? And this is the victory that overcomes the world. And here it is again. Even our faith, our confidence in our trust in God and his gospel system of salvation to save us from our alien sins and to keep us saved by the application of the blood of Christ to all those who walk in the light, see us in the light, that we might continue as the apostles did in the fellowship with God and with one another, those who love the truth. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. If I believe in Christ, the only proof I have that I truly believe in, that he is the Savior of the world, is to comply with his will. We won't go back now and do it, but last two or three weeks, we've referred to James chapter 2. James addresses Christians also. And he talks about a dead faith and a live faith. A live faith is nothing more or less than an obedient faith. And what is it that overcomes the world? Even our faith. Well, he can't be talking about a dead faith. Saying, yes, Christ, the Son of God, he's my Savior, but I don't have to do what he said. He has to be talking about the faith that overcomes the world is an obedient faith. After all, he explicitly said it, we've quoted it several times already in Hebrews 5, 9, that Christ is the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. For whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcomes the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. That can't be faith only, because faith only is a dead faith. Faith, James says, apart from works, is dead, being alone. It's the faith of devils, and the devil level of faith never saved any of them. So we need to keep that in mind. Now, I want to pause here. We're getting down to another part that I want to begin next week. And I hope this discussion is helping us, and I primarily think of Christians here, to realize how we stay in the fellowship of God as the apostles have. I hope these words are encouraging to us and we'll continue on with this, Lord willing, when our next time together. Right now, would you go with me to our Heavenly Father in prayer? Our Father in heaven, we're grateful for this time together. Help us to contemplate and meditate deeply on thy love for us and our love for thee. May we not only love thee, but love the things that belong to thee, to love our brethren. And may we all understand what that love is that it never sets apart or sets us apart from doing thy will help us to understand that love always leads us to obey the truth it never excuses us in disobedience help us father to love the truth to imbibe it to teach it to defend it and may we be concerned about those outside of christ who need to obey the gospel and we pray for them now that they will know the love of God and that they will have such a love of him and his son that they will certainly obey him. Holy Father, please hear this prayer. Help us ever to say not our will, but thine be done, and to always acquiesce to that truth. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.